Hey, good morning. morning. Welcome to Kesed. Thanks for being here. Uh, If you're brand new, especially to you, thanks for being here. I know church can be a complex space and uh, it can bring up a lot of complex feelings. And so uh, I know that down deep inside, you're like, I'm just going to give this one shot and, and, and maybe today's that shot. And then you saw the ice cream and you're like, okay, I'm going to give it two shots. (laughs) I'm just going to give it two shots and then that's it. Uh, because Jesus can use ice cream to, uh, to, to, you know, comfort you while you walk out some of your own spiritual uh, curiosity. Uh, we're launching a brand new series today called Hearsay and Heresy. Uh, this series is going to be a really important one for our church because, as you may or may not know, uh, Kesed is about 15 years old and we are growing, unlike we have uh, in our whole 15 years. And what that brings with it is uh, an importance of clarity around the things that that we feel God has called us to, to hold uh, true and, and hold uh, real and hold present. And also some clarity around stuff that uh, we just don't feel that God is asking us to pick up. And that can be a, a complicated thing to talk about. And so we're going to spend the rest of summer doing that and, and a little bit uh, teaching who we are and I think where we're going. Uh, to understand a little bit better why we are doing this series, I want to... I want to talk with you just for a minute about both where Kesed came from with this uh, space that we're about to uh, dive into and also where I came from. Uh, We say a lot around here that Kesed often holds this really rare space of gray. And another way to kind of understand that might be that we hold a spiritual posture of curiosity. I like the word last service someone said they like to understand it as a spiritual posture of mystery, meaning that basically we don't spend a lot of time driving every theological stake into the ground we come across, at least not around the beliefs and issues some feel are required for us to be a, this is a quote, mature meat and potatoes Bible teaching church. Whether you know it or not, We have been widely criticized for this. And by we, I mean me. (laughs) Um, I have been widely criticized for this, especially as our church has grown. I think when we were smaller, people are like, well, what does it matter? It's just him and 15 crazies. And now they're like, we need to deal with this man and these people. And so uh, this sermon is a little bit addressing that. And, uh, and I think it's, I think it's going to be authentic and I think it's going to be really honest if we can, can hold that space well. Uh, the root of our curious spiritual posture can be found within the influence of maybe one man more than any other, at least in my own life, and that man was Dr. Larry Shelton. Larry uh, came to our church a year after it was founded in 2010, and he stayed all the way till 2020 when he passed away. He was one of our elders, and he was a significant spiritual advisor in my life. Uh, I met Larry at a church service. He came up afterwards, and he was like, young man, I just want to compliment you on your message. And I was like, old man, thank you so much. <laughs> because, because you don't get a lot of compliments when you're a 30-year-old church planting lead pastor, especially from older folks. They're just looking at you like, there's just not enough gray for him to know anything uh, at all. And so uh, he asked if he could uh, grab a coffee with me, and I said, well, it's, it's an easy thing to do because my office is and has been at Panera Bread for the last year and a half. And so I'd love for you to come by. So he came to church, came to Panera Bread and met with me in my office. And, uh, and, and, uh, he was like, I just want to compliment you on like this kind of roughness that you have when you approach the gospel. And I was like, well, that's a, that's weird, but okay. And he's like, yeah, like there's just an authenticity and, uh, uh, I want to give you a word of curiosity. And I was like, okay, well, tell me more. And so he told me a bunch of stuff about the importance of this, which I'm going to teach you here in a minute. And then I said, well, Larry, let me teach you about, you know, church. And I want you to know, you know, because clearly, clearly you don't, you must not have a lot of church experience because why would you at your age be at a church plant? And he just kind of smiled. And so I I taught him all that I knew about, (laughs) about the gospel and, and church planting. And I was like, Larry, I'm just here to help you along the way because Jesus can use anybody no matter where they come to Christ in their spiritual journey. You know, even at, I think he was like late sixties at that time. And he was like, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be part of this teaching. And so we, we left it at that. And then I learned over the next few coffees that Larry was actually the professor of Wesleyan studies at George Fox Seminary. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
And, and, and through, I'll be honest, through the space he was able to hold with me, I was, I was just drawn into his presence because I knew that God had brought me a gift. Larry was a, an avid outdoorsman. And I remember one day he decided to introduce me and then our team and then really for the rest of the time with us, this concept of spiritual stakes. Uh, you, no matter where you are in your, in your spiritual journey, have spiritual stakes. And they usually start off pretty shiny. And, and by stakes, I mean stakes that go in the ground, not the ones you barbecue. You're like, I have spiritually shiny barbecue stakes? Like this is... This is crazy, but here we go. Uh, no, stakes that you drive in the ground. Uh, Larry would say to, uh, let's say, build a tent that you could dwell within spiritually. And Larry would say to me often, Danny, let's be really careful at Kesed, and especially in your own life, where you drive that first and most important stake. Because when you go camping, wherever you drive that first stake, all the other stakes have to be placed adjacent to it. You can't decide to be like, well, I've decided to drive this one and I'm going to walk over here and drive this one. It, it doesn't work that way. And he taught that spiritual thinking is very much that way, that you drive a stake and that stake then determines much of your other spiritual thinking. And so with that in mind, I want to uh, begin this message on a personal note. Because one thing you have to know is that I'm going to be teaching some of what Kesed is driving stakes around. But it's really important to realize that, that every person in leadership in a church, every person that teaches on this stage, they have to first and foremost drive their own spiritual stakes. And you also have to drive your own spiritual stakes. My stakes can't be your stakes, and this is the greater mistake. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's why I do this for a living, people. That's why it... But this is the greater mistake is people will think the church they go to drives their spiritual stakes. And it just doesn't really work that way. And so I just want to address everybody who really wants me personally to drive more uh, definitive and clear spiritual stakes in the ground. And I'm going to do that by reading an official statement. This is the first statement I've ever read in my career, first official statement. So allow the tension to be palpable because this is, I, I must mean this stuff, right? Because I wrote it down. And so I'm going to read it over you. When it comes to driving spiritual stakes into the ground of my own life, begin statement. I will start driving more theological stakes in the ground when I'm finished pulling the theological stakes from the spiritual ropes and chains that have been used to pin to the earth the hands and feet of those the church has deemed less than, other, ugly, and useless. Oh, there's more. <laughs> When there's a day when that work doesn't need to be done, I'll join your theological stake driving ministry. <laughs> this firm stance of mine comes first and foremost from the Holy Spirit's leading in my life and so my calling. It has also come from a great deal of experience. I have spent 25 years doing this work vocationally. Over those years, I have lost count of the number of times I have seen a pastor, Bible study teacher, or just general leader in the church plant a permanent theological stake around a founded belief and work for years building up and teaching others how they too can drive that stake into exactly the same place. Only then to one day, that leader find themselves falling more and more in love with Christ. And so suddenly learning more and more about who God sees them as. At this point, they then often try to change their entire past teachings to, to better clarify this new understanding of God, only to find out that they have built a following of people just like they used to be, who will then, just like they would have done years earlier, drive that teacher and their new fangled thinking out of the church and work of God. End statement. Before continuing, I want you to know that I have been waiting months to try and work into a message the word fangled, and I'm quite proud that I have done that just now. So it's a big deal. I just want you to recognize the, the pure talent that you're witnessing on stage. All that said, we don't have much of that problem here at Kesed. And that's because every few years we do a series like the one we are beginning today. Over the years, my beliefs have been developed by the Spirit in a great deal. They have deepened, they have evolved, and they have matured. And it can be around grand theological concepts or around really small ones that this has, has, has uh, 
transformed the way I understand God and my relationship with him. For instance, just around the concept of this idea that God loves me, but doesn't just love me, he actually likes me. The church does a great job teaching people that God loves you. He died on the cross for you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And I think a lot of people can't understand that, like the sacrifice of a life laid down for them. But because God is eternal and because he is still alive and still operating and still moving in relationship with us, I think sometimes when we think about God's love for us pictured within a sacrifice, we think that every time God sees us, he thinks about what it cost him to love us. But when you start thinking about the fact that God likes you, like he likes you, he sees you and sees things he designed in you that are just unique to you. The way that you laugh, the things that you laugh at. Like, like God invented sense of humor. I don't know if we realize that. Like all of the things within humans that, that we are, God invented. So that means God has an amazing sense of humor. And I think when he sees us laugh at something, he sees us take joy in something, those are things that God put in us that he resonates with. And he's like, oh. Man, I just really like them. Even if it's not in a typical way. Like, I know God likes me. You can ask my wife. I tell her all the time. <laughs> and I know God likes me because I get this strong sense from him that when I push the edge just a little bit, like all the other spiritual beings, the angels and maybe the apostles and maybe the witnesses are like, Ugh, like, why do we keep using this guy? And God's like, he's like that grandfather who disciplines in public. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. We got to do something about that. But then privately, he's like, I got you, boy. <laughs> that was awesome. That was crazy. You can't get away with that stuff very often, but that was good. I just know that he likes me. And that has evolved. And it continues to bring me comfort. And I guess before I move on, for whoever this is a gift for, I just need you to know, in spite of your mistakes, your lifestyle, your background, the trauma you've experienced or the trauma you've brought to others, God likes you very, very much. It's just an important thing not to just move through in a message. So I hope you hear it. And if you don't know that, maybe you should be curious about it. It reminds me spiritual formation of kind of like parenting. Uh, do you remember some of you, if you're, if you're brand new to parenting, you just had your first child, uh, you're probably very structured. I know I was. You're probably very linear. You have rhythms. You have bedtimes. Like everything makes sense. Well, if you're anything like a lot of the parents I have been around, or even my wife and I, when we had small children, by the time you get to your third child, you're like, do they have socks on? Good enough. Let's go. <laughs> when I first uh, started planting the church before this one, because I was a part of another church plant, uh, my wife and I had our son, Gabriel. This is a picture of Gabriel, I think around three or four years old. And Gabriel was one of those children who was just naturally obedient. Uh, and, and I love this about him because it, it made the church planting we were doing fairly easy. I remember one Sunday that uh, we walked into church and there was a lot of stuff going on. It was pretty hectic and children's ministry hadn't been set up yet because we were in a school. And so I grabbed Gabriel because I wanted him to be safe and I took him to a kind of a side hallway where they had a couch and I sat him on the couch and I said, Gabriel, look at me. And I said, I need you to stay here until dad comes back and gets you so I can check you into children's. And he was like, yep, okay. This is before iPads, this is before phones, this is just, you know, him and a, I don't know, I act like I'm, like I raised my kids in the 20s and a piece of string, right? He just played a, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. <laughs> there was no electronics at this time. And so we set up the church, right? And then children's is finally set up and then we did the service and then we tore down everything and then the rhythm was we would go to the children's worker who would keep the pastoral staff's children till last because we were part of the teardown team. And so I went to her and I said, hey, uh, can you give me Gabriel? And she goes, Gabriel didn't come to church today. And I said, he most certainly did. And she goes, Danny, I have not seen Gabriel. He was never checked in. And I realized immediately what had happened. I had left him on that couch. And when I went and found him, you know, he had made this amazing thing with his string. It was incredible. But he had stayed there at four years old for well over three hours, three and a half hours. Well, I loved this because, because as, a, as a pastor, as a pastor, I remember kind of being really proud of the fact that Aaron and I were just so good at this parenting thing. <laughs> And we, and we leaned into it all the time. We were like, well, you know, I mean, look at Gabriel. Like, and he would like 
He was just, he was just that kid. It was amazing. It was amazing. He was like flying a kite. It was like down, up, go over there, drink, down, up. It was crazy. And so people started asking us, older people with multiple kids, parenting advice, to which I was like, happy to give. And I was like, listen, you just got to talk to them on their level. You just got to give them the snacks at the proper time. Like, what time do you do bedtime? Eight? Maybe think about seven. What's your bedtime routine look like? Like, how do you behave? How do you discipline? And people are like, okay, 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 okay. And I was like, I'm just happy to help. And then this hellion was born. This little redhead child, of which we call Taylor, was scowling at people at six months old, <laughs> literally giving stink eye to people at six months old. She listened to no one and rules were just meant to be shattered and then mocked. She was terrible. I don't know what kind of parenting Aaron tried with her, but I just, I just, <laughs> I, I was very busy at the time. So I was like, well, clearly, and the reality is this is just how she was made and it's how Gabriel was made. I remember that we had a small group of all people without kids but us, and Taylor was so rough that they bought us a book on parenting that they were like, we don't know what to do for you guys, but we feel like this will help. We had fallen so well in the parenting world because of her. What we learned was the value of parenting humility. And that sometimes things are made different than other things. And sometimes in our own lives, when it comes to our spiritual transformation, some things come easier to people than others. And often what we do is we lean into the things that come naturally to us and we build spiritual foundations on those things. And we plant deep stakes inside those behaviors. And we're like, oh, this is the right way to do it because it's easy for you. And then we look at someone else who wrestles because they're made different with the thing that's easy for us. And then we look down on them and are like, let me know if you want any help with your spiritual formation. <laughs> but then of course, people come to us about the things we've planted stakes poorly in and they offer to help us. And we're like, no, 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 that's, that's not for me. Have you seen the things I do well? This is like someone saying, I want to talk to you about how you parent your redhead. And I'm like, who cares? Have you seen this child? <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm like, Make them an omelet. I mean, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. And so here's how I want you to think about spiritual curiosity or gray. The posture of spiritual curiosity that I love so much isn't just for curiosity's sake. Instead, what it teaches me, and I hope you, is the incredible value of theological humility. That we understand that when we read the Bible at a certain season in our life, we are going to receive it a certain way. When we hear a sermon at a certain season in our life, when we hear a podcast, when we read a book, it's going to hit us a certain way, oftentimes based on that season and that thing that we are wrestling with. But theological humility says that it is a spiritual posture that isn't afraid to ask around all topics, but what if it's bigger than I can see or understand right now? What if there's more God has yet to reveal to me? What if this spiritual posture I'm leaning into of this very obedient child is, is more about how I'm made than it is about some sort of truth about all four-year-olds? And spiritually speaking, it's hard to do this. But here's what happens to me and I hope you when we work hard to stay in that curious gray space. Although it may feel sandy sometimes, when God does begin to lay a firm, non-moving foundation in your and my life, it can be felt as solid and assured as the very earth beneath my feet. Jesus shares the parable in Matthew. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Total side note, this is the only service I'm gonna do this in. Uh, I want you to notice that when you follow Jesus and build a life upon his words, or when you don't follow Jesus and choose not to build a life upon his words, the rain and floods still come. 
People think that following Jesus means you found like this little, this little cove where there's like no storm and there's no waves. And you're like, I don't know what's going on, but I follow Jesus. So why is it so windy in my life? I'm like, it's always going to be windy. Storms are always going to come. The difference is what is your life built upon? It's an important thing for us to embrace. And at the end of the day, the, the meaning within the meaning of the parable might be that we are not called to build a life in the sand. So we must work hard to know the difference between how the two feel, which means we cannot live only in gray for the entirety of our spiritual lives. Gray is an important posture, even a beautiful one. But we are not supposed to pretend that the gray spaces carry the same weight and assurance as the black and white ones. So here's a concept to uh, allow you to still embrace your black and white, because it's, I think, as, as people of belief who want to know what's true and what's not true, what's false, what is hearsay, like, I, I don't know, and what is, like, heresy and, and wrong. And I think this is a beautiful way to do it. Think of black and white also in shades. Shades of black and white. This is how most people think about black and white. There's this side and there's that side. And you're either on a black stance on this topic or a white stance on this topic. I'm not a, putting any moral to the, to the shades. I'm just, I'm just letting you know, like, that's how people think. And I understand that because that's how the church teaches us to think. But even some black and white issues, as you spiritually evolve, will become even more solid in their defining as you spiritually develop. So how could a all black issue become more black or an all white issue become more white? Well, the reality is everything that we think is black and white probably isn't as black as it should be or as white as it should be. You might think of it as this image. There is no gray in the image. There is still truth and lies. But the perspective of how those truth and lies interact and impact your spiritual involvement will change over time. And what happens when people lose their spiritual identity is they are told there is only one big black and one big white, and you can't have any of this curious space where you're like, I think it's, I'm, I'm still black, but there's some white around here. I think I should be curious about how I move in and out of some of these philosophies. Think of the, the, the other parable that Jesus shared in Matthew. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. Here's the thing that I don't think people understand about the story. All the seeds that fell came to life. It wasn't like, there's some seeds, and dead didn't grow, dead didn't grow, dead didn't grow, grow. No, it's that this one grew and then the sun came because it was sandy soil and it died. And then this one grew actually in pretty decent soil, but alongside it was thinking that didn't allow for some of this movement, thorns. And so they were choked out and died. And then this one grew and the situation was right and the circumstances and the posture of the person were correct. And so of course the faith grew. Unequivocally, every single seed had some sort of life. But it was only shades of growth. It didn't last because it wasn't firmly planted. And so we must remember that God is always calling us from this sort of seasonal spiritual growth. How are you doing? I'm up. I'm going. To a sustained spiritual growth that allows for pruning. Doesn't mean you don't suffer. Doesn't mean the storm doesn't come. But it allows for pruning. But the roots are deep. And I think it's hard for us to realize that, that we are part of that, to that soil tilling situation and that we have to honest evaluate where have we planted some of these thoughts. Are they among thor thorn bushes? Are they among shallow soil? Or are they planted in good quality earth? The name ancient Christians use for these types of separating sand from stone spiritual discussions was orthodoxy. Ortho is the Greek word for straight, as in an orthodontist makes your teeth straight, or an orthopedic doc makes your bones straight. 
Doxa is the Greek word for glory. And so the etymology of the word orthodoxy is based on this idea of making upright or straight what we believe about God's glory. This is what we are working to do inside this series, Hearsay and Heresy. We are going to be doing the work of separating what God created from what man tries to take for his own glory. Now, every series this year so far has had a tree, and the tree symbolically represented kind of the core teaching of that series. And we did that because during the Christmas season, we taught the importance of biblical icons and how God often uses iconography to explain who he is. And so he'll be a dove or a lion or a cave or a storm. There's these beautiful pictures. And so we said this year to help us just grow deeper in our understanding of God's word and his presence, let's build a tree that represents every single series. This is the tree that we made for this series. I want you to imagine this tree represents every single organic tree made by God, designed by God. It grows, it adapts, it reproduces, and when the time is right, it dies. This is its natural, designed by him way. When it comes to pulling apart hearsay and heresy, we must be able to separate what is natural from what is unnatural, what's designed by God and what is man's woven thought, our own often woven thoughts into the fact that, for instance, God loves me, but he doesn't really like me. There's an organic truth to how God loves and likes us. And there's an organic truth to the fact that because God loves and likes us, by the way, sometimes he prunes or disciplines us. But what we like to do is weave our own thoughts into the thoughts of God. So when looking at hearsay and heresy and using this tree as an illustration, I want to just kind of give you a, a, a vision in your mind of how that could look. Here's a framework for using this tree to show how that might be experienced. When you come across a belief taught by man, taught by the Bible, taught by the world, taught by anything that you, that you hear, you must first ask this question, does this belief align with what the Bible says? Is it organic? Is it rooted? Is it planted in deep soil? Does it have leaves? Do those leaves fall off? Do they return? Are the branches facing the sun? Does it align with what the Bible says and how God operates? That's what scripture is doing. It's teaching us this is how God operates. The question then you might ask to pull out some heresy is when you hear a thought is, or does this belief align with, the, with what's popular in culture today? Suddenly there's something inside the tree that's like, that, that's still there and it still aligns and it's still following the general path of the branches, but it seems different. Another question might be, does this belief align with God's character and righteousness? Does it, does it reflect his nature? Or does this belief I'm wrestling with align with what feeds my own ego and ambition? How about does this belief add or subtract from the gospel message? Or does this belief align with the message I feel best makes me the center of the story? We are called to separate what is truth from what are lies. And so choose the way of the creator of all good things instead of our own. And the hard part is sometimes they're beautiful. Sometimes they're distracting. Sometimes they feel like, well, they, they could work. But the truth is, it's just us weaving a version of truth into our souls so that we feel like we have a bit more control and don't have to be quite as accountable to the one who brings us through the natural seasons of life. With that in mind, each week in this series, I wanna discuss either an open-handed or a close-handed issue. These are also known as debate for, we can debate these, let's wrestle these out, or die for issue, or just hearsay, mm, I don't really know about that, or heresy, this is truth, or this is lie issue. The subject of today's conversation is going to be salvation because it's the most straightforward of all the ones that we are walking through. I have said for a long time that everyone I've ever met, once you really get to know them and hear about their life and kind of their, their path and how they operate, goes to some sort of church. Uh, people often will hear about what I do or, or uh, hear about like where I spend my time. I'm like, yeah, church isn't really my thing. And I'm like, oh, well, curious. 
what is your thing? And it's like, well, I spend a lot of time, you know, down at the golf club, or I spend a lot of time uh, at this certain hobby group, or this is an important one. I spend a lot of time at the bar. And if you really kind of parse these things out, you'll begin to realize that church is supposed to be a place to find belonging, acceptance, answers, truth, community, and ultimately love. This is what all of those people are looking for. When they devote themselves to their social media personas, their junior high, high school, college social structures, or even the local country club, bar, or hobby group. In that same way, we are also all lacking salvation when we can't find it in Christ. This is why we cope, numb, risk, chase, fight, and hide. Because if I can't save me, and you can't save me, then what even matters? Why would I bring my full self to this relationship? Proverbs 16 says it this way, the plans of the heart belong to man. The plans, the ways we, we look at things, the ways we try to scheme or the ways we just try to provide. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. This is the human condition and it is a sickness. Sin is the biblical definition of that sickness and it carries with it a death sentence. When the Bible talks with us about how without Jesus you will die, it's not just talking about cessation of life. It's actually talking about separation from God for the ultimate death is to be separated from God. Sin is therefore a sickness that can only be healed by Jesus because Jesus through his death on the cross restores relationship with God and therefore gives life. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus very much wants to do this. Jesus describes it this way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now you might not think that's that significant until you actually begin to study other religions. Uh, that, that, that musician from quite a few years back, Keith Green, uh, shares in his testimony how he studied all of these other religions and then eventually found himself a Christian. And when they asked, why are you, why are you choosing Christianity? He said, well, because in all the other religions, every single one of those deities tips their hat to Jesus. Everyone is like, well, he's a prophet like me. Maybe not as powerful, but he is. Or he's a teacher of good things like me. Or he is a reminder of this, which I have taught. All of them tip their hat to Jesus. And then Keith said, but when I came to Jesus, he like tipped his hat to himself. <laughs> Acts 4, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This good news that is Christ is what's known as the gospel. So I want to be clear, because it's as straightforward as I can teach it. It is heresy to believe in any way of salvation other than Jesus Christ. And that's because Jesus Christ is our and every other human's very first tent stake. Everything else revolves around that one truth, that there is no other way to be saved from sickness of sin, no ritual, no right, no level of self-discipline or enlightenment that can bring you everlasting life. Jesus is the only way. And with that tent stake in the ground, we can then step back and evaluate all the other nuanced teachings, even the beautiful ones, even the ones really pushed by the church. If Jesus is your only way to salvation, then it confuses me when a church will teach, like many, many do. We're going to get a tiny bit provocative because I read you my statement earlier. This is just part of who I am. For instance, the belief that baptism is required for salvation. Now, baptism is very important. It's a sacrament. It's taught by scripture as something we as Christ followers are supposed to do. It's, it's a, an outward sign, as they say, of an inward commitment. 
and lets the community know and you know that you, have, that you have given your life to God and that you have gone onto the water, which kind of represents the earth. You have gone into the earth and you've come up a new creation, bathed in his spirit, purified by his, by his blood, and it's all sorts of beautiful things around it, and it's important. But it is not a core tenant or a core stake to the level that Jesus is. Now, you might be like, I don't know if I agree with you. And I'm like, awesome. Because one of the goals of this series is not get you to be compliant or agree. It's get you to be curious. So here's my curious question for everybody that holds that you have to be baptized to be saved. There's a little story in Luke about Jesus giving up his life for us. He's hanging on a cross with two criminals. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So one criminal was, was, was cursing him, if you will. But the other rebuked that criminal saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied to him, ready? Truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, clearly, I must be missing some verses. Because for us to understand that baptism is required to be with God in heaven or paradise, this conversation would have had to happen. Jesus would be on the cross. This gentleman would turn to him and say, Lord, in spite of all my sin, my darkness, and the things I deserve that I'm being punished for, right here in the midst of my punishment, I want to be with you in heaven. And then Jesus was like, oh, awkward. Uh, hold on, hold on real quick. You, can you climb up here? Could you pull his nails down? kind of drag him to the river, throw him in, and then, and then put him back up on the cross because I want to make sure people know you got to be baptized in order to be saved. Instead, right there in that place, right there pinned by his sin, held by his habits and addiction, Jesus says, I see you. I love you. And I like you. Ultimately, he says, I forgive you in spite of the fact he was clearly not baptized. And this is because it's not baptism that saves you. It is Christ. The stakes are not the same. Although beautiful and important, they are not equal to one another. This leads well into some hearsay we have around salvation and how it happens. The style by which, if you will, people are saved. As if it's always supposed to look the same. Altar call, come forward, confess, repeat after me, amen. Well, I can tell you, I didn't come to Christ that way. I was the, the dedicated babysitter at 11 years old of my parents' Bible study. And afterwards, after I had given all the kids back and I was eating all the leftover snacks, I had this sudden conviction. <laughs> I was like, I think I have some questions about God. And so I took my dad and the pastor into another room and I asked all my questions and they answered best they could. And at 11 years old, I prayed a prayer just, just myself and I left there the believer I am today. A shade of it at least. Pastor Chris Potter, uh, who teaches here often, uh, came to Christ different than Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe did come to Christ in an altar call. Come down. Repeat after me, amen. Again, not a bad thing. Pastor Chris came to Christ in announcements. I don't even know if you can do that theologically. I asked him again for the story and he was like, yeah, the lady was like, later today we're gonna have a kickball tournament. And Chris was like, yes, Lord, I'm convicted. And after that, we're gonna have a potluck. I repent, will you come into my heart? How weird is that? The style just doesn't make sense. Psalm 3.8 says, salvation belongs to the Lord, not to you and I and how we perceive it, which means it is hearsay to proclaim that how Jesus meets us has to be a certain way. The way in which God meets someone, heals their sickness, and so saves them is not for you and I to decide. Nailed to a cross, sitting in the front row of a church service, even during announcements, Jesus meets people where he wants, how he wants, because Christ does what he wants. And so we must ask this question in closing, do we have enough theological humility to hold that Jesus can be both our only source of salvation, even if the way he saves other people exists outside our categories for who is and how he is allowed to save them? 
Our faith has to be large enough for that. Otherwise, you are just the biggest hypocrite of yourself. Because I guarantee if I spend enough time with any of you who have followed Jesus for any amount of years, there are things you used to believe 20 years ago that you do not believe today. So why wouldn't there be space in your thinking right now to think you might believe some stuff right now that you will not believe tomorrow? Now, does that mean every black and white issue is gray? No, I put up the image, the checkers. It was brilliant. (laughs) There is no gray in it. There are shades of black and white that we move through and that gives us unbelievable empathy for the curiosity of others when they show up very, very confident, especially new Christians about how God works. And you're like, that makes a lot of sense to me. I can see that in your story as as a, you're, you're seeking, you're searching. Let's get coffee. Let's, how many people in the room could literally do what Larry Shelton did? Be taught by me because I just figured this old guy needed help and sit for three coffees. Before he's like, I got double doctorates. That's not important. I just want to help you. And I'm like, ah, this is how I think Jesus met with people. He's like, I don't know. I just know where fish are. Let's go. (laughs) He's like, it's weird, but okay. And then eventually Peter, eventually Matthew, eventually all of them come to a place where they realize they will forever be on this spiritual journey with their faith growing because their God is. I'll close with, uh, if you've read the, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Prince Caspian book specifically, seen the movies, um, you might recognize that the lion Aslan represents the Christ figure. And he always shows up in these really beautiful spaces and, and he's just a, a really a pretty good representation of some of these characteristics, again, of who God is. And the little girl Lucy hasn't seen Aslan in one scene for a long time and then she sees him and she rushes up to him. And she says, Aslan, you are bigger. And he says, that is because you are older, little one. And she looks at him with curiosity and says, not because you are. And he says, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. We are supposed to serve the lion of Judah. We are supposed to serve the Christ who is not controlled by us, who is not owned by us, who is bigger than we are, can often make us uncomfortable, who challenges, but also protects. And we have to have space in our lives that our God is beyond the box we can fit him in. But unfortunately, many of us have tamed him into a house cat that we put away when friends come over because he's just kind of, I mean, we let him out on our own when we have those sunrise sunset mornings. We engage with him in our journals, of course. We sing to him in the car and we pet him when on our way to church or maybe even in the pew right now. But in reality, I feel like Aslan's more like a lion leering down upon you while you try and sleep as he looks into your eyes and says, what shall we kill today? Or what shall we go on a journey to discover? Or I'm going to protect you today. Or There's some stuff we need to talk about today. Either way, you look upon the face of a lion, your heart's gonna be like, I'm uncomfortable. And Jesus is gonna meet you there. He's supposed to, and he's gonna be like, I know, but that's just because there's more of me you need to know. Because the more you know, the bigger I'll get, the more fierce I'll get, the more protective I'll get, the more forgiving I'll get, the more grace-filled I'll get, and also the more powerful I'll get. And you will live in this curious developing space Where you're like, I, I just want to get to know you like you know me. I want to be loved by you like you love me. I want to like you, God, like you like me. And I want to introduce other people to you like you've introduced yourself to me. This is what this church and this part of the country and this part of the world is supposed to do because it's really hard to hold grace, curious, mysterious places. But I'll tell you, it speaks to the people in our community, that there is space for their questions, there is space for their doubt, there is space for their anger, and that means there is space for their love and there is space for their hope and there's space for their acceptance and forgiveness. And whatever that looks like, I think we're supposed to create that space together. So that's why we're doing the series. Now, I've had a few people say, uh, we could lose a lot of people if we do this. 
And I'm like, listen, with great respect, I've said it before, it's not a punchline, we just don't have that many parking spaces anyways. (laughs) So what if we just fill them with the people who wanted to be here to do this hard work? There's so many other great churches doing great work, great work they're called to do. This is not special work, but it is our work. And so may we ride with our God into whatever version he wants to build in our community. And may we do it with a loyalty that is fierce and genuine as his is for us. I'm inviting you to be a part uh, or I'm inviting you not to be a part. That's okay too. I hope you find what you're looking for because I'm here to tell you, you grab hold of this house cat who turns into a lion, you'll know it. But he's not gonna behave for you like you want. And you know, I don't really want him to. He's our lead pastor. He's our source. He's our guide. He's the one. All of us, I hope, are forgotten and his kingdom is pushed forward. Just like those who planted this church and then those who gave it to us, we're gonna give it all away eventually. And it's gonna be a beautiful, beautiful day. And my prayer is you're here when that happens. So pray on it, wrestle with it. Send me a nasty email. (laughs) You're loved where you are, as you are. And Jesus wants so much more for you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this service, for this experience, um, just for you, what you do and the way you do it. May we, uh, may we be ruffled by the message from your spirit. May it hit us how it's supposed to hit us in whatever season we're in, wherever we are in our path. We just, uh, we just lift it all to you. We, we're grateful that we even get to be a part. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks all for coming. God bless, and uh, we'll see you next week.